Visions and learning the scripture from my book, The Life of God's Righteous Servant of Isaiah 53. In the first years of my punishment, chastisement, maltreatment, crushing and bruising by the words and power of God, as his righteous servant described in Isaiah 53, he gave me incredible visions that served as storylines for what we did and what we talked about during that time. The most involved was water in the temple, and it is a good example of how God would use the stories of the Tanakh and the New Testament to teach me the scripture using visions and use it in my daily life in God's fire of refinement. One summer, I, I think in 2009, he first spoke to me in 2007. As I was being prepared suitable for God's purpose, he had me terminate my law licenses uh, in Hawaii and in Texas and quit working. And I was living on my last dollars at a weekly hotel outside of Houston in a rural area. God was cutting me off from the world of material things and association with society to fulfill the prophecy of being cut off and taken from the land of the living of Isaiah 53 verse 8. I was in his grasp every moment of every day, my every move at his direction, listening and talking to him. This writing is of a vision based on a story of a vision by Ezekiel. God taught me through much mental duress and anguish how to prepare for a vision in a meditative state of mind. <clears throat> it takes an hour or more and you cannot let yourself fall asleep. That was in the early years. Today, he can just take me into a vision meditate a state of mind or not. One night, God had me read Ezekiel chapter 47. And this has, uh, this is the first verses 1 through 12. He led me back to the entrance of the temple. And I found that water was issuing from below the platform of the temple eastward since the temple faced east, but the water was running out at the south end of the altar, under the south wall of the temple. Then he led me out by way of the northern gate and led me around to the outside of the outer gate that faces in the direction of the east, and I found that water was gushing from the south wall. As the man went on eastward with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits and led me across the water. The water was ankle deep. Then he measured off another thousand and led me across the water. The water was knee deep. He measured off a further thousand and led me across the water. The water was up to my waist. When he measured yet another thousand, it was a stream I could not cross, for the water had swollen into a stream that could not be crossed except by swimming. Do you see, O mortal? He said to me, and he led me back to the bank of the stream. Okay, that's, the, that's, that's verses 1 through 6. I don't need to go through uh, 7 through 12. After discussing every line of these verses with God, I had a vision of entering the temple gate on the east side. The temple as I had seen it in pictures rebuilt, though the sacrificial altar in front was not there. I am looking directly at the entrance in the front, just inside the walls. And from beneath the doors, water is pouring out and flowing down the steps. I look down and see my bare feet are in water, up to my ankles. God always speaks to me during these visions. I had visions 
I have had visions of angels, but they never speak to me. The next day, I went to the Addicts Dam Reservoir at God's direction, just outside the city limits. The rain had been coming down hard, starting to fill the reservoir, which is usually just a dry, low area of land with levees to keep the water from the city. God had me take off my shoes, which was unusual, and head to a path that went up and over the levee, which is about 30 yards high in walking distance, and into a barren forest. Following the path, I came to an easement for electrical lines, some 50 to 75 yards across, and going off into the distance as far as I could see both ways. It was filling with water. As I stepped forward, I looked down and saw my feet immersed in water. Just as in my vision, except that instead of stone, it was grass beneath my feet. I turned to the right as I came to the center of the easement, and the water was now knee high. I worried about stepping on something sharp and cutting my feet. I kept walking, and every hundred yards or so, the water was deeper and deeper. The easement dropping as I went along. It was slow walking, and we were talking about many different things all around me, and the scripture also. I could see far ahead a large electrical tower. There was a mound of grass in front of it raised up above the water. When I reached it, the water was now chest high. I rested on the mound, and then God told me to follow the easement to the left. It was miles to the next levee which I could not even see. I started wading down the easement and the water was soon over my head. I was very cold and tired. God told me to turn around and start back. As I was heading back and the water was again only knee deep, God told me to leave the easement and head into the forest. Walking where he was guiding me, I went into a field of small withered trees filled with thorn vines and patches of stickers all around on the ground. I complained to God that the thorns and stickers were tearing my skin and were too painful to walk on, stopping every few feet to untangle vines from my clothes. God told me to keep walking until finally with bloody feet and ankles and shins, I told him I can go no further. God told me I could stand there all night or continue walking. He had all the time in the world, and my anger at that overwhelmed me, and I thrashed around further entangling myself in thorn vines until again I could not move. As the anger lessened, I carefully pulled myself free and stepped into a clear area and kept going. It was getting dark. God had me continue in aimless directions in and out of thorns and stickers. God finally relented and directed me to the levee path and my car. This punishment of walking barefoot through thorns, vines, and stickers was for me. This maltreatment, this wounding, my self-will and hot temper needed a lot of refinement. This is why he call it God's fire refinement. Wounding, punishment, chastisement, maltreatment, crushing and bruising. This is by no means the only way God has and is refining me. It is a seemingly endless and very process. This is the 13th year since he spoke to me in 2007. And he does not sleep, which means I don't get to sleep much, two or three hours a night. Between him and the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit, they always have something to say, something to make me better, some new pain to show me they can inflict on me. <laughs> and he continue, I tell him, we say it, 
I, I, I put together the two books that you dictated to me, which really took about five years of learning, five years of writing uh, in a blog, and then about a year plus to put the first book together, Isaiah 53, and the Day of the Lord. And we just did the book that this chapter comes from here recently, and it didn't take any time at all. Most of it is done, this refinement, in his words and power in the room that I live in. He told Ezekiel, go to your house. I bind you with the cords of my power. You shall not go out amongst the people. He told me, go to your room. Actually, I take care of my elderly parents, 92 and 85 years old, in exchange for room and board since I don't have any money until recently when I filed early for Social Security. But I give almost all of it to them uh, just to make up for 10 years of being here. How Ezekiel's vision and my vision and the story of my day in the flooding reservoir and fields of thorns and stickers are to be interpreted with the meaning for this day of God speaking to his prophet again has not been told to me. Some visions are just for a good story. My vision in the temple was just for me and preparing me for the next day of refinement of my uh, soul, spirit, and self. Another example of a vision that served as a storyline for teaching me the scripture began in the Houston City Memorial Park where God had taken me out for exercise. This was a bit, <laughs> it takes me out for actually, sounds funny, every time I say it, it makes me think of taking your dog out to get a walk. This was a vision in spirit rather than body. In the vision at the temple where I could see my feet in the water, I was in body. In a vision in spirit, you do not have a body. And even spirit cannot see spirit. That's what the angel of his presence tells me, the, the Holy Spirit. They, they, all, they, they don't always explain everything to me. I, I'm not on the uh, executive committee by any stretch. I am a servant. I'm a servant that needs a lot of refinement. If you were to uh, pick up this book, you'd see that there's about seven chapters of my life as quickly as possible, mostly just setting forth major traumatic injuries I went through. And then I think it's chapter 7, it's entitled, God Speaks to an Atheist. And I was, you know, I've gone 50 years and had nothing to do with God or religion or even people who were religious. Because if you talked about God or Jesus around me, that was it. I wasn't going to talk to you ever again. I didn't want anything to do with it. I had just been banged up too much in my life and I just didn't care for any of it. Had never read the Bible. I had jogged around the three mile loop at the park that I had been running around since my high school days and was cooling off sitting under a tree talking to God about walking or jogging home. When, without any notice, I was in the heavens, the galaxies, looking out at the most amazing sights I have ever seen galaxies and everything in them and as I looked on I glanced down and I had no legs and didn't realize I had no body this is the first time I've been in a vision and spirit and you don't really think that you, you don't go yourself oh I'm in a vision that's okay <laughs> you, just, you just don't you think what he has you think I felt like a pair of eyes that night, God said to me to get my Tanakh, read Ezekiel uh, chapters 1 and 10. The important part of Ezekiel 1 for this vision is verses 15 through 21, beginning at 15. As I gazed on the creatures, I saw one wheel on the ground next to each of the four-faced creatures. As for the appearance and structure of the wheels, they gleam like barrel. All four had the same form. The appearance and structure of each was as uh, two wheels. <laughs> two wheels. 
cutting through each other. And when they moved, each could move in the direction of any of its four quarters. They did not veer when they moved. Their rims were tall and frightening, for the rims of all four were covered all over with ice. <laughs> and when the creatures moved forward, the wheels moved at their size, and when the creatures were born above the earth, the wheels were born too. So that's Ezekiel chapter 1, 15 through 19. The moment I read, <laughs> for the rims of all four were covered all over with eyes, I knew these eyes were the spirits of the Jewish people from my vision and spirit. The important part of Ezekiel 10 for this vision is verses 9 through 14. So this is now chapter 10. He picks back up. It's the same vision. He says it at the end. But just so you know, and the creatures are now cherubim, angels, but he says they're the same ones. Verse 9. I could see that there were four wheels beside the cherubs, one wheel beside each of the cherubs. As for the appearance of the wheels, they gleamed like barrel stone. The cherubs moved in a direction in which one of the heads faced without turning as they moved. Their entire bodies, backs, hands, and wings, and the wheels, the wheels of the four of them, were covered all over with eyes. It was these wheels that I had heard called the wheel work. Each one had four faces. One was a cherub's face. The second, a human face. The third, a lion's face. And the fourth, an eagle's face. Now, that's Ezekiel chapter 10, 9 through 14. I, uh, I skipped a couple of verses that were repeats from chapter 1. In verse 12, the eyes are shown to be on cherubs called creatures in part 1 of Ezekiel's vision. In verses 18 through 20, the spirits of the Jewish people collected on earth are taken to heaven as God awaits them. Verse 18. Then the presence of the Lord left the platform of the house and stopped above the cherubs. And I saw the cherubs lift their wings and rise from the earth with the wheels beside them as they departed. And they stopped at the entrance of the eastern gate of the house of the Lord with the presence of the God of Israel above them. They were the same creatures that I had seen below the God of Israel at the Shabar Canal. So now I knew they were cherubs. That's Ezekiel chapter 10, 18 through 20. There is also an account in Ezekiel 37 of the resurrection of the dead that begins in verses 1 through 6. This is verse 1. The hand of the Lord came upon me. He took me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many of them spread over the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, O mortal, can these bones live again? I replied, O Lord God, only you know. And he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus said the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live again. I will lay sinews upon you and cover you with flesh, and form skin over you, and I will put breath into you, and you shall live again, and you shall know that I am the Lord. The Rambam, Lemonades, compiled what he refers to as the Slosha, Asar, Akam, the 13 fundamental principles of the Jewish faith, as derived from the Torah. Lemonades refers to these 13 principal faiths as the fundamental truths of our religion and its very foundations. 
Number 13 of the 13 fundamental principles is the belief in the resurrection of the dead. Ezekiel 1 and 10 are together a vision of the resurrection of the spirits of the dead to heaven. The creatures later identified as cherubs, a type of angel, with the spirit are going to and fro, east, west, north, and south, having eyes to themselves and the wheels, <clears throat> themselves and the wheels, and taking them to the platform of heaven at the entrance of the eastern gate of the house of the Lord, with the presence of the God of Israel above them. All of Israel, whose name will endure in the heaven God is creating, that are righteous and in right standing with God are the eyes on the chairs and in the wheels. The eyes represents the eyes of the spirits of the dead, a spiritual heaven, and not a physical heaven on earth described as the world to come in Judaism, which comes after the Messianic age. For behold, this is God, for behold, I am creating a new heaven and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered. They shall never come to mind. Be glad then and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I shall create Jerusalem as a joy and her people as a delight. He's building a new world. That means this world has come to an end for this spiritual heaven. In some fashion, some way, in some place. <laughs> this has to be in the same spot for him. That's Isaiah chapter 65, verses 17 through 18. 17, 18. For as the new heaven and the new earth, which I will make, shall endure by my will, declares the Lord, so shall your seed and your name endure. That's Isaiah chapter 66, verse 22. Ezekiel 37 gives an account of raising the dead to life into new bodies of flesh and bone. This was a common belief in the ancient age and Middle Ages. In this age of information with knowledge of science, medicine, and the human body, few people believe that the human body can or will be resurrected anew by God. It is a primitive concept that was good for a time from antiquity to the Middle Ages. That is why God provided visions of resurrection of the dead, conforming to the beliefs and the world of the Jewish people in antiquity and the Middle Ages, and a spiritual heaven for a more enlightened time of reasoning and knowledge. The burden on Israel and the practicalities of such an event which is to include the resurrection of every Jewish person who has ever lived. That would include the, Hebrew, the Israelites and the Hebrews. All of them. Suddenly appearing in the land from the time of Abraham to today is unimaginable. From the million Israelites in the Exodus, or some people say as many as three, it's, I think it says 600,000 men and their families to six million from the Holocaust alone. That's that's seven million. That's how many Israeli Jews is that but you know, give or take, there are today. All of a sudden there's gonna be an equivalent amount of resurrected dead Jews from just those two time periods. You gotta include the four hundred years in the Exodus, all the time before that, then you get uh no yeah, prior to the Exodus. They were savage, ignorant people. You, you can't put them to work here. And by all accounts, they were still eating meat raw with the blood. You're talking about, I, I don't know. Somebody <laughs> needs to put a calculator to it, but uh, I don't know that you can fit all these resurrected people into Israel. It would absolutely destroy the government. They couldn't take care of them. And you, you'd have to send the IDF in. And I don't know if they could do anything with that many people inside their borders. They have enough trouble with just Palestinians. 
no training to work. They'd all have to be housed and fed and educated. The resurrection of the dead in the human body is also said by Rambam to be a sign that Moshiach has arrived or that it will happen in his lifetime, Moshiach. There's no scripture that supports that. There's no scripture that supports he's going to be a king and gather a kingdom. Nor is there any scripture that says he's going to restart the Davidic dynasty. But in his time, and he sees the descendant of David coming, you know, he, he, he lived in antiquity. He died before the Middle Ages started, from somewhere between 1200 and 1400, something like that. And... You know, communication, information, nothing was the same as it is in this world. There was something that could be believed in. But not today. God knew in the day of the Lord, which is why I'm being trained up, he has to have a representative like Moses. It's, it's pretty simple. He got a new covenant to be delivered from Jeremiah 31. He says, I'm coming back. I'm sending my messenger to clear the way for me. That would be to build the temple. The angel of the covenant that you desire is already on the way. Well, there's only two covenants. Covenant of friendship that God grants when David is here. And the new covenant of Jeremiah 31. I will forgive your sins and iniquities. And that will cause Torah to be written on your heart. And everyone will heed me. Well, <laughs> the covenant that you desire has to be that covenant because you want to be sin forgiven of all sins for all Jews, everybody given a clean slate, you know and the teaching of the righteous servant is time to be observant, you've got a clean slate, show your respect for what he just did to it for you in this, this, this day of the Lord the time to come of Jeremiah 31 and uh, be observant, go to the high holidays you know, practice Shabbat, don't work on Saturdays, do mitzvahs everywhere you can. So I, I, I am Moshe. Okay, I'm the descendant of King David because the Spirit of God alighted upon me and entered me as, as the Spirit of God did with Ezekiel. And then he could hear God speak because God is in his Spirit. And I've had that in two previous videos now, uh, where I'm more detailed. This is a teaching from the ancient age and middle ages that continues today. Well, I'm here and nobody's been resurrected. There's no sign of me coming. And as I said, if it did happen, it would destroy Israel. Can you imagine waking up in the morning saying, uh, 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 billions of deceased Jews have just come to life in Israel? Huh. I <laughs> wonder how that's going to shake up the Middle East. Maybe we could use them to drive out the Palestinians, send them back to Jordan where they belong. Judaism's reliance on everything the sages say in an era gone by by the oral tradition is important for the laws of the Torah. But the Talmud's stories, opinions, and commentaries outside of that had to be used in view of the light of the age of reasoning, science, information, and knowledge. And, and you have to you have to to re-verify that these beloved men such as and brilliant men, there's no question, who dedicated their life to the Hebrew Bible, the scripture, and uh, discussion of matters in the town, and commentaries. But you need to double check them sometimes. In the Messianic era, it is said that the entirety of the world will speak Hebrew. So, does that mean when Moshe gets here and he's to fly to China? where one-third of the world's population is speaking Chinese and get them all to speak Hebrew? Do you think that's going to happen? Well, I got news for you. Moshe doesn't even speak Hebrew, much less Chinese. So that's going to be a definite issue. But you know, but it's wrong. You know where he gets that? 
from the chapter and verse, I can't remember the book or anything right now. I have it written down in the book. God says, he will make the peoples of their pure speech. So he takes that phrase, it's like a Christian, just taking one phrase out and, and leaving the parts that are kind of conflicting with what his commentary is going to mean, his opinion. He says that means everybody will speak Hebrew. Well, look at the verse before it. And you'll find out he's not talking about the world. <laughs> Just go read your sense. Uh, you can find it. Just do a search on it. Um, no, the peoples of pure speech are the Jewish people in Israel. And guess what? It's true. <laughs> they speak Hebrew, man. That's the official language along with Arabic in the state of Israel. But it's not the world. And yet that's part of the Messianic era. The world's going to lift up and exalt and love the Jew. Well, again, is Moshe going to travel to China? Is he going to get him to do it? Or is God going to wave that magic wand of his? You know, God is, is creating this, this, this heaven for the Jewish people with the name Israel shall endure. No Christians ever invited. No Gentiles. They want to go to heaven and see God's heaven. They're going to have to convert to Judaism and become Jews. And um, that, and the reason is because when he forms an angel, he has to create their personality. What he's done here on this earth, and by selecting a chosen people, the Jewish people, is force them to go through incredible suffering. Of magnitude, we can't even imagine the Holocaust, pogroms, you know, on and on. And he does that because because it makes them the kind of people he wants, people who can overcome, people who who are compassionate towards others. And uh, it's part of the reason they think Isaiah 53, the current teaching today, not what the sages said, not what Rambam said. But apparently what Rashi did say, although there's some conflictions on that. But anyway, uh, his, own <laughs> his own inconsistencies. I don't know if conflictions are a word. But anyway, um, I'll get back to it. The day of the Lord and they were... And the arrival of God's servant David, according to the prophets, must be interpreted with the evolution of humanity from the ancient age into the age of information in mind, the ages in between, and in the ages to come. There will never be, and Rashi was, Rashi was, or said to be the, the first, a rabbi who thought that Israel was describing Isaiah 53 primarily because of, of the God's fire of refinement uh, that he put Ezekiel through, where he uses words like crushing, bruising, now treatment, chastisement, punishment, wounding. And um, they generally say that the witnesses are the kings, and I'm assuming they mean leaders of the nations, and nations means Gentiles. If you're talking about the nations, you're not talking about Israel, you'd say Israel. So it's talking about the Gentiles are the witnesses in, 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 that, in the story of, of uh, the righteous servant. And the first six verses are put in quotes for a reason. It's a deparkation from the three verse quotes that begin his description in chapter 52, 13 through 15. And it's these witnesses, and what they're basically saying is... He's going through a fire of refinement. That's why he's bearing all this stuff. By his bruises we are healed. Or that's his stripes. He was wounded for our sins. Well, they're, they're unrighteous. That's their sickness. Their guilt is making them sick. Because that's what he offers himself for. Okay, now you're the righteous servant. Go make the people righteous that, that you can draw to. That's what the story's about. Yeah, why, why is he making a righteous servant? And, and, well, anyway, that's what, and there's no crucifixion, by the way. 
the Christians use those same words and say, uh, by, uh, Jesus was sacrificed for our sins, um, and by his blood we are healed. No, it's just what I've had to go through for 13 years and, and to make me the righteous servant and to be a prophet of God. See, that's going to make many, many people say, you mean God is really here doing something? He's doing what he said he was going to do. Huh, I'm going to have to think about that. I might want to listen to this fellow one day. So, uh, as of right now, that's the idea. I don't know what it's going to be like when we finally get to Israel. But we'll get there. That I can promise you. Yeah, the Israeli government will not be replaced in the kingdom created. That's what I was missing. If God knew it was going to be a democratic country, it was all things. He, he, he has walked from the beginning of mankind to the end of this earth. The evolution. And see, okay, well, that's too detailed. But anyway, yeah, of course he knew. Of course he knew it wasn't going to be a divinic dynasty restored. <laughs> As I mentioned, I was an atheist for 50 years, and I don't really, in which God, being trained up as God's servant, I'm more likely to be cussing him and complaining than I am to be praising and worshiping him. I can't, I can't ask for anything. I'm not allowed to ask for anything. He's taking my self-will. I know better. I ask for something, I may as well fling myself out the second story window and hit the scene in. Because he's done that to me in his power, I don't know, three or four times. Yeah, my chin always hits first, and he busted open blood everywhere. <laughs> and I get up, what's wrong with you? And he'll say, I'm oh, nothing wrong with that. Doing <laughs> just fine, thank you. I'm God. This is what it's like. Every day he's infuriating me. That's just like what he told Ezekiel. Ezekiel, you're going to suffer the punishment, which means for the sins of the house, for the Jewish people, the houses of Israel and Judah. He's a priestly man. He's been trying to get him to straighten up, stop sinning his whole life. You th and he had a furious spirit, he tells us. You think that didn't make him mad? It made him just as mad as God slamming my head down on Satan and in his invisible power. <laughs> anyway, that's, that's, that's the refinement. Yeah. There's a lot more stories. There's a lot added to that in the book, by the way, that answers you. Uh, David, the shepherd, his line through Solomon, including the line, the biblical kings of Judah, etc., etc. Okay, so all this, this is stories, this resurrection of the dead, stories for the illiterate that cannot be prophecy. God's world will never be at peace. That's the other thing. You're supposed to have peace and harmony. How's Moshe going to do that? I say he goes to Korea first. Get the night north of the South Koreans to, to shake hands and be buddy buddy. Yeah, that'll be a job. That's easy. God's world will never be at peace. God tells me that when he writes a story around events that have occurred, he usually has three purposes in mind and sometimes four. The people of antiquity could not read but loved the good story, and they needed to hear uplifting verses. Life was so brutal. To create religion and religious controversy. And he always says, see the book of Daniel. Because he's not even in that book. He's not a prophet, as Jesus says. It's not even in the books of the prophets. It's in the writings. And, and the Christians go nuts over it. They think it foretells the return of Jesus, who told us when he was coming back he never did it five times. You high priest will see me return. Members of my twelve, there are those amongst you alive who will still be alive and I'll return. People of Caesarea Philippi, there are those amongst you who will be alive and I'll return. This generation shall not pass. Before all these things occur, that announce his, his return. And then my favorite, in the Revelation, the great Revelation, 
written by a madman is what it sounds like. But uh, seventh verse, Jesus speaking to an angel. See, somehow, sometimes I say, you know, the Christians will figure out a few things that the Jews have not gotten in Judaism. What's, what's, what's God, as they call him, speaking to an angel? Whereas God did it in the burning bush. There's an angel of the Lord in a burning bush that is not consumed, and God speaks to Moses. Well, that's speaking to an angel. God is in his angel, who is the Holy Spirit. His angel of his presence. So anyway, they picked up on that, but, but, but this is what he said. Those who pierce me with a spear will see me return. That would be the Romans who stabbed him with the spear to make sure he's dead on the cross. And so I'll dead. <laughs> he's not coming back. And in the last page of the Revelation, three different verses. I'm coming back quickly. I'm coming back quickly. I'm coming back quickly. <laughs> well, I don't care who's saying it. 2,000 plus years later is by no stretch of the imagination quickly. What a religion. God performs human sacrifice so the Gentiles do not, can be forgiven of violating his laws, being guilty of violating his laws and commandments. Uh, another reason to make the Bible fun to read and for prophecy. The visions that I've learned in every single book that, that he taught me, you know, Keith, read this, read that, read the New Testament, third chapter or something, you know. Um, he t I've had some kind of vision. They were different. Body, spirit, visuals. I can be, I can be wide awake and, and have a vision one time. The first time he did that, I could see the feet in a large uh, robe walking through the clouds above me. And I'm out on a busy um, six-lane street. And I'm looking at it as though it's as real as can be. It didn't phase me. <laughs> but uh, the stories I have, I mean, 13 years, day in and day out, just me, him, the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit. And they don't sound like, uh, like each other at all. God sounds like an adult man. The angel of his presence sounds like an angel. He's got almost a, a childlike voice. And uh, he's, he's just, he, he just, he's, He's the greatest comedian that ever lived. He keeps me laughing when God has me crying. <laughs> Without him in this, I, I well, God have drug me through it, but it's the reason I laugh and smile today. I didn't for 50 years of my life. <laughs> I was always looking to get into a fight with somebody. It's because it made me feel better. <laughs> but uh, God's knocked all that out of me. He can still irritate the fire out of me. When he came to me, I was an atheist who had never read the Bible, never was, a, okay, I've already said all this. God wanted me, he kept me, he told me, no, I steered you away from anybody that could uh, teach you anything about the Bible or religion, you know, except a little bit that made you not like them. Uh, he wanted me to be a Bible and religious blank canvas for him to paint the pictures of biblical understanding in my mind as he would have his stories and prophecies understood. Remember, God's dictating this. I think it's pretty good prose. Good job, God. God's interpretation of his book. Again, um, those two books... They're unpublished. For a year and a half, I tried to get an agent, sending out all these query letters, and uh, and then for the longest time, I was sending everything to publishers who would accept manuscripts, which does not include the big five publishing companies of America. But I hit all the big ones in Israel, and uh, if they bothered responding, <laughs> responding, they said no. And I'm sure it's because... It just turns Judaism upside down, and they think, well, this, we don't even know what he's talking about. <laughs> That's the only thing I can figure. But uh, it's his books. I think he'll get them published one day. Just like these videos. Are, you know, I'm just a servant. 
I, I didn't know I was going to be doing this uh, particular video at this particular time today, or even if we were going to ever do anything on the book of my life, uh, as this video comes from that book. Um, like I said, he didn't. He keeps me, <laughs> keeps me edgy and irritated <laughs> these days. But I have so many stories of his power and what it feels like. See, I don't just hear his words. No, his power is constantly on me. It's heavy. He can make, he, I can be walking. And let's say I'm a, a hundred and uh, uh, eighty pounds. And it, all of a sudden he can make my entire body feel like it's 280 pounds. To where I can barely lift my legs and my knees are starting to hurt. <laughs> continuing to walk. But then he can take this power that envelops Ezekiel. He called it cords of power. William Devils me too. And then in that power, he can suddenly make make moving and walking as easy as, as it was before he made me heavy. Except I still feel heavy. So many different things. And you can feel it going through you at times. Um, sometimes, you know, the power uh, is it's great to have. It feels so good. It makes you, can make you so calm. But usually he uses it to hurt me, like slam me to the ground, things like that. I know. Listen, if you go, oh, God wouldn't do that. That's pretty much what I was saying. Well, gee, are you sure you're God? <laughs> you laugh. He laughs all the time. <laughs> and, it, and he'll laugh using me because I'll be livid. And all of a sudden, <laughs> this is what you hear. <laughs> I'm like, did, did you just laugh and just slam me down to the ceiling or on the ground? <laughs> you see, I know it's not me. Y'all can't tell for sure. You could be acting if you don't believe me, but it's true. He can talk through me. I mean, I'm looking in the mirror one day. I had never seen him do it, and all of a sudden he jerks my head up in that power. That's face-to-face, -face, by the way. He just takes your head, points it. Get your eyes and sit right here. This is where now we're talking face to face. This is where I am today. I said, okay. All of a sudden, my head goes up, and I can't remember the conversation, but all of a sudden, he just starts saying something to me using me. The voice was a little bit different, but the, the thoughts of those words weren't coming from my mind. And then the Holy Spirit made me laugh. He said, don't you think that's wrong of him to do that? To use you, to talk to you, in the mirror, don't say it's wrong, Keith. <laughs> you know, he did, he did. You know, a lot of people don't have my, the way I laugh, my humor, uh, and he could be however is necessary because he knows me as God knows me. They, they've been in me since birth. Well, since the first year. The Holy Spirit says, why would I want to be in a womb? We've waited for you to be born. Because that's what Jeremiah called it. He says, God has been with me from the womb to make him a priestly man, a godly man, a good man. With me, it's all opposites. He said, God said, no, nah, you had to have a lot, a lot of, of suffering and be familiar with the disease. And he goes through these accidents. He'll take me back to an envision, you know, being gut shot. He said, that's, that's when I got your cancer going with the tumor because of the I had colon cancer. The blood went through my colon. And I always thought it activated dormant cancer cells, the trauma. He said, no, nah, I did it. And he said, in, in, in orchestrating you getting gunshot, which he showed me what he did, he said, he said that's just more suffering. Scars and stuff. <laughs> you know, disfigured me at birth. I don't have a right breast. See, the man of Isaiah 53, I'm the exact opposite of the Jesus Christ. The exact opposite. Blemish, defective. You can't offer me as a sin sacrifice. <laughs> Guilt, rams, you can't offer me for anything. And that's the man of Isaiah 53. <laughs> it's, it's to make sure I can discredit him as his righteous servant when we get this thing going. That's yeah, you know, and I, I was, I was, I was can't sin anymore. I was a sinner. I wasn't a habitual sinner, but it turns out <laughs> he took me back and showed me kind of like Scrooge and you know, the ghost of Christmas past. 
And I say, Chef, like, that's the same? He said, yes, Keith, that's the same. But anyway, I can't do anything on my own anymore. He's got that power on me, control my thoughts and minds. So I'm sinless now. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I was a sinner. I, I wasn't teaching at synagogues when I was 12 years old. You know, I don't have... <laughs> It's total antithesis of who he is. And by the way, if you get this book and watch some of these tapes where his name's mentioned, some of the deceits and lies that come from his mouth that's in their book, especially when they say to fulfill the prophecy, Jesus says, all the prophets say of me, I shall ride this ass into Jerusalem. <laughs> And there the Gentiles will mock me, spate on me, spite me, scourge me, kill me, that I shall rise on the third day. As all the prophets say to me, all you got to do, if you're a Christian and you read that, is go, I think I'll verify that. You know what you're going to find in your Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible? Nobody says it. You got 20 prophets right there. And none of them come close to me and go, hey, wait a minute, here's Ryan and Asin to Jerusalem, but most yet. Oh, yeah, exactly right. What, what does that say? It says he rides, he rides, <laughs> oh, man. He, anyway, he, he rides and Asin to Jerusalem. Next verse. Instead of it saying he's going to be, the Gentiles going to mock, scourge, and, and kill him. No. It says he goes in and... <laughs> And breaks down all the swords and arrows, and 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 and, and makes the countries of the Middle East surrender to him, and he becomes king of everything. And, and that's what the prophecy says. That's that that is the prophet he's referencing. You know, you know why they could get away with that in antiquity in the Middle Ages. Nobody could read. There's no bookstores, no scroll stores. If you could even get your hands on them, that's how they got away with that. But you can't let the Christians get away with it anymore. And that, you know, his wrath on them, that's my biggest task. I've written as the prophet like Moses. I have announced in those books and on tape, the new covenant is here. Every Jew in the world sin free right now to be a holy seed to build a third temple. Just as he did for the Assyrian Babylon exiles, forgiving their sins, and they built the second temple as a holy seed. Uh, of course, very few people know about this. But, uh, yeah, this is God's today. I figure he's going to get it done. See, he won't tell me what tomorrow brings. You know, he just doesn't. i, I got to continue in the human existence. He's, <laughs> like, fall down and hit my face on the man. He's got a justification for everything. You can't, you know, I know the Jewish people say, well, you can argue with him because Abraham did. Go ahead. You can honor till you're blue in the face, you ain't never gonna win. <laughs> just, you, know, you can't win. He might let you think he won, but he's probably got an evil purpose behind it. That's the Holy Spirit speaking to him. Anyway, she get the book, and uh, I'm, I'm sure we're going to do a few more chapters out of it. Thank you for listening, and have a good day.